Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review, or at least making a start, of possibly quite a long review actually, so great intro, of We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, Volume 5 of the Collected Stories of Philip K. Dick. Uh, basically I want to eventually read everything that Dick ever wrote, so this is sort of one step in that direction. And um, yeah, what's weird is that Volume 2 of this as well, is also called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, so I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't make it easy for people. What I'm going to give you is the list of stories here. So we have uh, the introduction, the little black box, the war with the Fnools, a game of unchance, precious artifact, retreat syndrome, a Terran odyssey, your appointment will be yesterday, holy quarrel, we can remember it for you wholesale, not by its cover, return match, faith of our fathers, the story to end all stories for Harlan Ellison's anthology Dangerous Visions, nice title, the electric ant, Cadbury the beaver who lacked, a little something for his temper noughts, the pre-persons, the eve of the sibyl, the day Mr. Computer fell out of its tree, the exit door leads in, chains of air, web of ether, strange memories of death, I hope I shall arrive soon, Rautavara's case, and the alien mind. So, uh, yes. So I thought this was quite fascinating. There's a, a quote that kicks this off uh, from an, a Philip K. Dick interview, 1974. So I thought this was fascinating. This is from a Philip K. Dick interview in 1974 from Only Apparently Real. He said, How does one fashion a book of resistance, a book of truth in an empire of falsehood, or a book of rectitude in an empire of vicious lies? How does one do this right in front of the enemy? Not through the old-fashioned ways of writing while you're in the bathroom, but how does one do that in a truly future technological state? Is it possible for freedom and independence to arise in new ways under new conditions? That is, will new tyrannies abolish these protests? Or will there be new responses by the spirit that we can't anticipate? I don't know, I thought it was interesting. That was 1974, that interview. This was published in 1991. It's now 2020. And it's still just as relevant. <laughs> okay, so here we are from The Little Black Box. We have a reference to Matsu Basho, who was, uh, it basically is the Japanese Shakespeare. Uh, this story was uh, interesting because it had lots of like Zen and Buddhism and stuff in it as well. Uh, then we have the, the, the war with the Fnools. So uh, I just want to read this bit out here basically. Um, so the Fnools are like these two, meet, two feet high aliens. Uh, the other Fnool pondering said, I wonder if there's any way we can grow taller. Is it a racial secret preserved by your people? Noticing the burning cigarette dangling between Lightfoot's lips, the Fnool said, Is that how you achieve unnatural height? by burning that stick of compressed dried vegetable fibres and inhaling the smoke. Yes, Lightfoot said, handing the cigarette to the two foot high fnool. That's our secret. Cigarette smoking makes you grow. We have, all, we have all our offspring, especially teenagers smoke, everyone that's young. I'm gonna try it, the fnool said to its companion, placing the cigarette between its lips. It inhaled deeply. Lightfoot blinked, because the fnool was now four feet high and its companion instantly imitated it. Both fnools were twice as high as before. Smoking the cigarette had augmented the fnool's height incredibly by two whole feet. Thank you, the now four foot high real estate salesman said to Lightfoot, in a much deeper voice than before. We are certainly making bold strides, are we not? Nervously, Lightfoot said, give me back the cigarette. I quite like that as well because I have some friends called the Lightfoots too. And basically this is how it ends as well. I, I mean, this is quite a dumb short story and there's no like deep thought behind it, but it was amusing, you know? How can it be made to grow again, Lightfoot said, as he and Major Hawk descended by means of the stairs. A cigarette started it, then the Scotch, both new to Fnools. What would complete their growth, make them a bizarre eight feet tall? He racked his brain as they dashed down and down, until at last the concrete and steel entrance of the shelter lay before them. The Fnool was already inside. That's um, Miss Smith you hear, Major Hawk admitted. She was, or rather actually, we were, well, we were taking refuge from the invasion down here. Putting his weight against the door, Lightfoot swung it aside. Mrs. Smith at once hopped up, ran toward them, and a moment later clung to the two men, safe now from the fnool. Thank God, she gasped. I didn't realise what it was until... She shuddered. Major, Captain Lightfoot said. I think we've stumbled on... I think we've stumbled on it. Rapidly, Major Hawk said. Captain, you get Miss Smith's clothes. I'll take care of the fnool. There's no problem now. The fnool, eight feet high, came slowly towards them, his hands raised. So I guess in a way that's like a love letter to sex, cigarettes and alcohol. I'm down with that. And we have a game of Unchance, I don't have too much to say about that, and that brings us on to the next one, which is Precious Artifact. So in this one I like the fact that there's a randomly yo-yos are in this. And it's funny because yo-yos are kind of becoming cool again. <laughs> and they were cool when I was at school in like 1990. Well, actually later than that, 95. <laughs> okay, so um, 
As a matter of fact, Dr. De Winter said, we know they're at this moment gathering in red area to hear your account. Opening his desk drawer, he got out a yo-yo, stood up and began to operate it, expertly doing walking the dog. Your panic-stricken speech to the effect that something is wrong, although you can't seem to say just what it might be. Watching the yo-yo, Biscle said, that's a toy popular in the proc system, at least so I read in a homeopath article once. Hmm. I understood it originated in the Philippines. Engrossed, Dr. Winter now did around the world. He did it well. And then we get a... It's a stimulant dispenser and a space sport, so you can just casually... Like, like the guy says, uh, May I stop at the amphetamine dispenser and put in my dime? I need a stimulant to cheer me up. Christ. And uh, on Earth in this story, pets are illegal because of overcrowding, and he's um, thinking maybe on Mars one day pets will be legal again, and that cheers him up. Then we get a reference to the military of 2014 as well. Um, Boy, these prox men look scary. You'd almost, step them, you'd almost expect them to step out of that exhibit and fight us to death. They put up a good fight before they gave in, those prox men. You have to give them credit for that. So somebody offers a doctor some coffee and he says, uh, Lord, no. It sets the vagus nerve off for four hours. One of the characters goes to see his, I think it's his wife or ex-wife, uh, and she goes, how come you're up so early? You never used to be out of bed before eight. I haven't gone to bed yet. Yep. Sounds relatable to me. Okay, we have obviously the title story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, which I just skipped because I've previously read it. Here we have Not By Its Cover. What did I highlight here? Uh, so this thing, it asks some of the questions about um, eternal life and whether you'd want it or not. And it's about books as well. So basically there's this creature that has a sort of sentience and you can bind books with its skin and then uh, somebody has the idea of maybe building a coffin with it. We have Faith of Our Fathers, uh, which is like a sort of communist-inspired story, I guess, which I've read in the past, so I skipped that one as well. We've got here the story to end all stories for Harlan Ellison's anthology Dangerous Visions. So, um, uh, I guess that's fairly self-explanatory. He wrote this for an anthology, but as it's super short, I thought I might as well read it out. In a hydrogen war-ravaged society, the nubile young women go down to a futuristic zoo and have sexual intercourse with various deformed and non-human life forms in the cages. In this particular account, a woman who has been patched together out of the damaged bodies of several women has intercourse with an alien female there in the cage, and later on the woman, by means of futuristic science, conceives. The infant is born, and she and the female in the cage fight over it to see who gets it. The, yo the human young woman wins, and promptly eats the offspring, hair, teeth, toes and all. Just after she's finished, she discovers that the offspring is God. Then we have the electric ant, which is another one um, that I had previously read, read and remembered. So this is all about like manipulating reality. Reality is basically a computer program and you can amend your own reality. Uh, in Cadbury, the beaver who lacked, he uses the term wool gathering, which always reminds me of Charlie Heathcote. Here on booktube there's a kid who got uh, caught breaking the law. Um, he says, when I was 18, I stole four crates of Coca-Cola from a parked truck. You were apprehended at the scene? No, the man said. When I took the empties back to cash in on the refunds, that's when they seized me. I served six months. And this is basically, uh, this, this is a story called The Pre-Persons. And the idea behind this is basically it's, um, it's, talk it's, it's looking at abortion basically, but it looks at what would happen the other way around if we said that basically in this society, people aren't uh, can, thought of as having souls until they can perform advanced mathematics, which is about the age of 12. So abortions are legal up to the age of 12. So in this story, we, we get little lines like this one here. Let's have an abortion, Cynthia declared excitedly as she entered the house with an armload of syntho groceries. Wouldn't that be neat? Doesn't that turn you on? Her husband Ian Best said dryly, but first you have to get pregnant. So make an appointment with Dr. Guido. That should cost me only 50 or 60 dollars and have your IUD removed. I think it's slipping down anyhow. Maybe if... Her pert, dark, shag-haired head tossed in glee. It probably hasn't worked properly since last year, so I could be pregnant now. Ian said corsically, you could put an ad in the free press. Man wanted to fish out IUD with coat hanger. I think um, a lot of the issues that Dick investigates in these stories, um, I don't know, they're ones where th times have changed, you know. Uh, here we have the Eye of the Sybil. And I thought this was interesting because this is presumably autobiographical. Two weeks or so later, I had to fill out what I wanted to be when I grow up, and I thought of my dream about the man from another universe, so I wrote, I am going to be a science fiction writer. That made my family mad, but then, see, when they got mad, I got stubborn, and anyhow, my girlfriend, Isabel Lomax, told me I'd never be any good at it, and it didn't earn any money anyhow, and science fiction was dumb, and only people with pimples read it. 
so I decided for sure to write it, because people with pimples should have someone writing for them. It's unfair otherwise, just to write for people with clear complexions. America is built on fairness, that is what Mr. Gaines taught us at Hillside Grammar School, and since he was able to fix my wristwatch that time when no one else could, I tend to admire him. And, I mean, that's a nice little nugget of characterization there, but I also like, uh, because, I mean, that's true, that's basically the same arguments we make today when we talk about the need for diverse authors and diverse voices to be represented. We have a character in uh, this story, the day Mr. Computer fell out of its tree, the character's called Joe Contemptible. And then in the next one we have Bob Bibleman, so I start to feel as though he was running out of character names at this point. So yeah, all in all, I really did enjoy this collection, I mean Philip K. Dick's fantastic. As I say, I'd read one or two of these before, so I kind of already knew what to expect from them. Um, but, like, I really did enjoy reading these, I don't think there was a duff story amongst them. Obviously there were some that were better than others, and, um, you know, some of the philosophies and stuff might necessarily have not have aged particularly well. But uh, it almost doesn't matter because I think the important thing is that, is that they ask you as the reader the question, you know? So, yeah, I definitely enjoyed these and I will be reading probably the other four volumes in this series pretty much as soon as I can get my hands on them. So, um, yeah, Philip K. Dick, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. So there we have it, that's what I thought of We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by Philip K. Dick. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.